All right, first I'd like to uh, thank for the invitation. Thank Bumadin for organizing such a nice uh, symposium here. Uh, another thing is like, I'd like to do double apologize. First is like, sorry for crashing on the Koopman party in the morning. Second is like, hopefully we can get it really soon so that you can, you know, not miss your lunch time. So uh, another sets of people I'd like to uh, acknowledge is Yiji Gu, Sun Wei Liang, and Hai Chao Yang. So these three are basically my consultant whenever we do deep learning, because I'm not an expert on deep learning. And Xian Tao Li is my collaborator, uh, you'll see, and He Chang was my former student. Okay, so these research are uh, supported by DMS and uh, ONR, Reza Malik Madani. So, okay, here's the mathematical setup. So uh, let's say you have an ergodic Ito diffusion X, okay? It solved this just SDEs, okay? Now, suppose that you have some smoothness assumption so that the stationary density is, I define it as P, it's basically a function that take this D-dimensional space, send it to, you know, a uh, positive value of X that solve this uh, stationary fokker planck equation. So for the Koopman people, perhaps this is just the adjoin of the stochastic version, if you like, but of course I can post the problem for the time dependent, but here, uh, let me just focus on the uh, time independent problem in this case, okay? So here's the task that uh, I would like to do. So let's say I am given time series of X, okay? So this is just, time series at discrete time, okay? Now, this time series uh, could be, you know, subjected to certain errors, like numerical integration errors. Let's say if we use Euler Maruyama to discretize the SDEs, then you induce certain errors, okay? At the discrete time delta t. Now, my goal here for this particular talk is to estimate p. Well, I'm not given a or b, okay? So there are various ways how to do this, of course. So here I'm just going back to, you know, in this particular talk, I'm gonna emphasize just do deep learning, but you don't have to do this. If you, your functions are actually simpler than, you know, uh, than, than, you know, necessarily need to do deep learning. So here first, you know, here's a strategy, a simple strategy uh, that we found like, well, it works in somewhat intermediately uh, high dimensional space. Well, I'll show you an example. So here, first, go, the first step is the following. Just estimate the drift term based on the time series. This is why we need the drift term. So you need notion of directions, right? So this, you, you estimate this. In this case, we pick the, uh, to minimize an empirical loss function uh, chosen from a hypothesis space of deep neural network. You don't have to, like I, I said, you can do, uh, features like uh, random features, like the, the entire talk yesterday, I think we're talking about random features, right? Now, once you do this, okay, you can also take the residual and employ another uh, regression problem to get the diffusion tensor, right? the diffusion coefficient, right? Now, of course, once you get these two, then the question would be like, you know, the mathematical question would be like, Let's say if I have my estimated A and B, right? If I now run a new Markov chain under this approximated drift and diffusions in the long run, how good would that be compared to the original invariant measure, right? So that's the real underneath questions. So basically in effect it's like perturbation theory of like I'm making a mistakes on estimation of A and B you perturb it a little bit, I'm not accidentally, I'm not making an accident to perturb it, but the perturbations indeed comes from error of your estimation of A and B. And how is that error carry in the error estimation of, let's say, you know, invariant measure of the original Ito diffusion, okay? So then the third step that we are doing, you know, aside from that uh, deeper question is like, basically once we have this estimated A and B, we just solve the PDE, okay? Do another regressions to solve the PDE. So in this particular uh, presentation here, I emphasize, I just write everything down in one dimensional for simplicity, okay? So th there are a couple of issues that we, we, I'm going to point out actually. The first thing is basically the uh, incompatibility of the computational domain, 
right? Most of these density functions that we are interested in, they're like positive everywhere, right? They're not living on a compact space. Computationally, you can only contain under a, you know, a, a finite domain, right? And you don't want to actually estimate anything that is very, very small because it's very hard to do so. So basically, one of the things that we, we put an assumption here, and later on, I'll be a bit more quantitative about this assumption using certain type of uh, uh, appropriate, let's say, uh, uh, process to, to say like, you know, using some concentration inequality to rule out the possibility that it, it happened beyond this compact domain. So later on, I'll touch upon this issue again. But at the moment, we just assume like beyond a compact certain domain, then you have to choose, then the probability of this process to be there is small, okay? Now, okay, when we are trying to solve this PDE, there are various ways to do this, right? Here, basically, Here's one way to do this that uh, my collaborator convinced me to do this. I personally think this is not the best fit, right? There are very, why, why I say it's not the best fit? First of all, the first term is you're basically fitting the uh, PDE in a strong term. You could have done it in a weak sense, like in a PDE, right? You could have done better so that you don't need the second order derivative. Second, that thing to to, to estimate like integral of p to be equal to one, that's a killer in my opinion, right? If you don't have the data, you have to sample that things on the box when you live in the 20 dimensional or 50 dimensional, that could be a killer actually. So, but at the moment we're still doing so and they convinced me, hey, actually this works at least for the problem that we're doing. So I got nothing to complain to them, right? But I would say, I would personally, I like this paper by Zai, Dobson, and Yi, Li. What they do is instead of, they are forcing that uh, uh, unity condition, that the integral to be equal to one, they basically uh, take the solution and match it to the point measure of the data that are given. I think it's a much better way to do it, but it's hard for me to convince my collaborator to do it at the moment. The third is just, you know, fake boundary condition because they are doing a serious computation. Well, I'm not, right? I'm just sitting around and tell them like, this is what to do. So I cannot push too much. Yes. I can't, I will, I will, I will. It's just at the moment. Uh, well, I will assume basically the X is like, most of the time, later on, if you be patient enough, I'll assume like my x is actually sub-exponential. A little bit better than Gaussian, but it has some decay. So that we can say using concentration inequality that, you know, I'm, uh, given enough data. Okay. So, sorry, I didn't understand. Is it from some starting point or is it from all starting points? Can't be not from all starting point, of course, right? This is in the invariant, you know, in the stationary, right? Surely, if I start on the boundary, it must leave. Uh, you start from the boundary, then. If I start from the boundary of omega. Yes. I'm leave you, you, you can't. Well, you can, but you, you have to start in, in you know. That's what I'm asking. Is yes. Is it form in the starting point, or is it there exists? I would say there exists a starting point, right? I, I, I would say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, because it, it, there is a chance this is leaf, right? But later on, the quantitative argument I'm making is like, I'm going to make an assumption my x is sub-exponential, so that the probability that is beyond this is small, having enough data. So that's one way to counter this, all right? All right. So this third is just artificial boundary conditions. Uh, just put some, you know, uh, 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 directly. But at the end of the day, in the numerics, I believe they didn't even use the third one. Okay. So now let me point out there are existing works about solving uh, PDE using or solving uh, Fokker-Planck equation using uh, neural networks. There's is several that I know. Number three. These are two papers. Uh, but all of these works, they assume they know the drift and the diffusion, okay? So our problem here is like we do one more step. We have to estimate the drift and the diffusion first before we do that, before we solve the PDE, okay? 
Now, here, uh, before I do talking about any, any, any theory, right, is there even any theory? Like, first, let me just consider simple things, okay? Just start showing you a few examples. So here's a one baby example, 2D, not a big deal, right? The drift is like that. The, the diffusion terms, you know, B, you can see that, where basically uh, phi is just quadratic function. So they are all quite innocent here. Like even the drift term are just linear, so innocent. So really, if you want to solve this problem in, in, a, in, in a much uh, cleverer way, you probably don't need neural networks. You probably just need to fit like, you know, uh, a certain kernel type or certain features, let's say polynomial of degree two, you should get this, in my opinion, right? But nevertheless, we, 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 we try it with the neural network. So here's the explicit solution. It looks like that, okay? So first things, training errors, no problem. And then we test this. So in, in the sense of testing here, so basically I'm not testing how good is A interpolating new points or B interpolating new points, but I'm gonna test, let's say, how well is the Markov chain generated by this approximate uh, drift and diffusion generated the invariant statistics, right? Because that's one of the, the theorem that I'm going to emphasize later on, whether the error in the estimation of the drift carry forward, how is it scale carry forward in the error in the invariant statistics? So in this case, right, I don't know whether you can see, this is sort of like the true mean and variance of these two components. So this guy is just to tell you, like, if I just do Euler Maruyama and run this with a lot of data, then you can see, you know, the Monte Carlo corruptions or the Euler Maruyama error corruptions, right? So the third one here, the third column here is basically showing you if we actually run this new Markov chain with the, with the estimated drift and diffusion, what you got, right? So this is what you got is probably as good as that, right? But if you actually reduce the time step of the Euler Maruyama, you can actually improve it and get a little closer to, 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 to the statistics of the truth. So this is somewhat, you know, comparing just, you know, running this chain, okay? Now the next things, it's like, what about the density estimation? You solve this PDE, right? So the true solution is on the left, you know, the one on the middle is basically to solve the PDE with the true drift and true diffusion, just to tell you what you're gonna get if you are doing this, you know, without estimating the drift and diffusion, just the PDE solver itself, right? Using this neural network regression, what's gonna happen? So if an error, sort of 10 to the minus two there, and the last one on the last column, third column here, is basically solving the PDE where the drift and diffusions are estimated using neural networks, okay? So all this. So this is low dimensional problem, so it's not a big deal. I should emphasize, if it's a low dimensional problem, you don't need neural network. You could probably do better. Yes? Uh, you will see that later, probably in the theoretical uh, 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 description. Let, maybe I'll, let me answer you later. Maybe you'll see that. Okay. So now those are low dimensional stuff. So let's try it on a little bit higher dimensional stuff. So this is 20 dimensional uh, uh, particle uh, described by this uh, Langevin dynamics. So I just pick, you know, uh, Leonard, Jones poten Leonard Jones potentials here, right? Describe such and such, okay? Usually a canonical model for a certain type of molecular, right? So we use 20 particle on the cross periodic domains. So in this case, uh, V is velocity, R is just the displacement. Now, if you look at uh, the displacement, right? You know, this is the distribution of the displacement from the data. They're not good, but let's change the coordinate. Let's look at the relative displacements you know, defined as above, okay? So because this is periodic, then you only have like, now suddenly instead of 20, you have 19 dimension, and this is the D1, D2 until D19. You can see they live on those, you know, sort of connected close, close, close domain. So for some reason, you know, my collaborator pick, here's the box that I'm going to solve my PDE. That freaks me out actually when I, <laughs> when, when they do that, but they say this works, okay? So, so we got uh, uh, training, uh, training of learning the A and the B. You can see, B 
basically here's the order of the error. The diffusion terms is actually really tiny, the residual. So I should make an emphasize here that this particular, the diffusion terms of this particular uh, SDEs is constant. They are not depending on state. So this is just additive noise. So that means the diffusion coefficients on the focal plan equation, they're just constant. So in that case, we do not need a second neural network to learn the diffusion coefficients, right? Just take the residual as the point, okay? So in this case, right, we do the same thing. So I just basically just uh, check whether we are comparable. This is just the first uh, two component of the velocity and the uh, displacement. So you can see, you know, relatively, you, you can get that. You just compare Monte Carlo in this case, right? Numerically, you just compare this one. So they are relatively doing okay, right? And then you look at the density estimation. Here's, you know, 19 dimension, as I say, right? There are specifications on how to, what parameter in the neural networks they are used and so on. You can see the first uh, 10 was corresponding to the velocity that are Gaussian, but the, displace, the, the, the relative displacement, they're all like, you know, non-Gaussian, non, non, non right, skew. Right? So you can get, you know, relatively good estimates in this case. Okay. So there you go. Then we, we, we start to think like, okay, can we actually understand this a little bit? Right. All right, now let's try to understand this. So to strip this down, the problem into a simpler one, I, you know, only dare to, uh, to, to, to study this. Let's say here's the Ito diffusion. is the drift with the B. Uh, the A here is standard global ellipsoid, so it also implies that you, are, you have a linear growth. The reason why we need the linear growth is we want to use this to bound all of the even order moments. And then uh, the B is a bounded full rank matrix, just to make it simpler, right? And then we, we need a couple of assumptions. So first is that we assume like this is geometrically ergodic with environment measure pi. There are various assumptions on that, but one of the key assumptions that we need is like the generator has to be, you know, somewhat bounded in this sense, okay? Where, where, where this Lyapunov function V is essentially quadratic, okay? Basically, why do we need these assumptions is for the following. We need this to ensure that the Markov chain induced by the euler maruyama discretizations is actually geometrically ergodic with a measure, I call it pi tilde, here I didn't write it more, and pi tilde are close to pi. Yes? Can you raise your voice? Yes. Okay. Well, well, later on in the PDE setting, it's still gonna create a trouble. I think it's still gonna create a trouble. Okay, thanks for the suggestions. So, so in this case, why do I need these uh, assumptions? Is because I want the data, you know, that I discretize at least to be ergodic. Why do I do? Why do I need that? Because that is the data that we are going to use to do training, right? To do the training of A, to do the training of B, and to do the training of the P. Because I'm not going to use the true solution of the SDE, which I never have a hand on, to do the training, right? So that's why you want to make sure at least. That data itself makes sense, meaning like it's ergodic, and if it has an environment measure, that environment measure is close to the true environment measure. Okay, so that's the first things. So we, this is just a corollary in, in, in this uh, mapping list toward Huygens paper. Okay, so now perturbation theory. Okay, so here's the perturbation theory. The real things that we, we are trying to address actually is the following. Suppose like I have an estimator. My estimator, I call it a hat. It could be from your network. It could be from anything, right? And it is, you know, then this estimator, we assume is global ellipsoid, okay? And it's consistent in the following sense. So the error of this estimator point-wise here could be linear growth. 
it's not necessarily, you know, it's slightly weaker than uniform. Uniform is like you don't have, you don't allow the dependence on x on the right hand side. Okay? So if you do have this uh, conditions, right, then uh, let xn hat, okay, be the, uh, be the stochastic or Markov chain generated by this uh, approximate ito diffusions, okay, where you approximate the a hat, and then you take the residual of your approximation, you approximate the b, b, b hat, okay. Now in this case, you can show that basically uh, this expectation of these observations of this new Markov chain in the long run, it will converge to this invariant measure. So pi f is a notation of integral of f with respect to the invariant measure under the subnorm. Okay, it's bounded by the following quantity that has a scaling of epsilon here. So if n goes to infinity, basically this is going away, then you have an order epsilon. And this is supremum under the function that is locally Lipschitz and bounded by the Lyapunov function. So this is just standard uh, technical tools in this community, okay? So our proof is basically based on this paper by uh, Rudolf and Schweitzer, where in their paper, they, they basically say, you know, if you have an error in the, in, 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 in the perturbation of Markov chains, then you can characterize error on the right-hand side by the error of the transition kernels. So what we do is basically we just write it down what is the transition kernel and use Ito formula. And you know, basically the main message here is the following. This is saying if I make a mistake of order epsilon on my estimation of A, then that mistake will carry forward on the uh, difference on the invariant measure by order epsilon as well. Basically that's what we're trying to, to get here, okay? Now, all right, so now uh, going back to this, uh, Thing, right? Going back to this uh, domain issue. Suppose x is now sub-exponential, then I can basically use, you know, I can show like almost surely this, you know, EM discretizations is actually bounded in the ball. I can do that, okay? But I need an extra assumption. Maybe you're clever enough to tell me you don't need that, right? Right? Because <laughs> I don't know that literature. All right. So now, Suppose I, in the previous theorem, I didn't say what is epsilon. Epsilon is just arbitrarily number here. So now let me sort of characterize what is epsilon, okay? So suppose epsilon is the following. Here's a delta t times an L2 uh, error, right? Then this, uh, there, you can use matrix Bernstein inequality to show like, you know, your spectral error on your estimation of your uh, diffusion coefficients is actually order epsilon in high probability with n greater than such, okay? You can, you, you can sort of show this. Then basically, you know, this is sort of saying like, look, okay, there is an incompatibility of epsilon here, right? Because the previous theorem suggests that you need stronger than L2, right? Because all of the mechanism that are available to, for us to show you know, this closure of perturbation theory, you need some stronger subnorm than L2. And this is the L2 on the right hand side. So that's why you know, this is the most tacit assumption is you have to basically assume this epsilon to be your L2, nor your, 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 this error, right? Is somewhat smaller than L2. Unless if you're willing to go to the machine learning community and tell them, don't do L2 minimizations, do a stronger minimizations. So this is the problem here. The key tricks because incompatibility of topology, right? Now, in our case, right, basically we just use uh, DNN, right? So it's global ellipsoids. In this case, uh, we can we can show like a, a hat is actually also ellipsoid, and the, res, the we use this result by Horn and Hai Chao. Basically, if A is continuous smooth, then there exists a ReLU. You can approximate it with this uh, metric. Uh, in this topology, W1 infinity, which basically means the Lipschitz constant of A hat can be written as, you know, Lipschitz constant of A plus some constant, okay? Now, in, case, in this case, in case if your approximate dynamics has invariant measure, remember the previous perturbation theory does not assume so, but in case this does, then you can integrate that, take the limit, then you can say, okay, my approximate uh, uh, dynamics is actually order epsilon. So it just becomes simple, okay? 
Now, let me go use this, all this property, to basically give you a route of, uh, to deduce an error bound for our approximation of the solution of the PDE. Now, suppose, you know, let me denote p hat and n as your uh, deep neural network uh, best least square solutions. Whereas p hat is the analytical solution of this guy, which we need some assumption in order to make sure this is a well post, right? It's like coercive, all kind of Lux Milgram theorem assumption that you, you need for this. Okay? Then basically, the overall error bound, you can uh, deduce as follow. Here's your invariant measure acting on f, meaning integral of f with respect to pi. And this is integral of f with respect to your estimation or your estimated uh, solution. So, so you can basically, this is going to be uh, dominated by two contribution of error. The first term is contribution of your error in the drift estimation, right? The second term is your estimation on your PDE solver, right? Because this is now suddenly you're, you're solving the PDE, it has a true solution with that A and N on the top, but then, you know, you have to bound this too. This guy here, I used that perturbation theory earlier that I talked about to bound that, right? So now it's time for me to consult with my uh, friends who are expert on deep neural network. Like, how do you bound this guy, right? How do you bound that and how do you bound that? Right. So apparently there are lots of results here. So suppose if, for instance, right, this is according to my uh, Hai Chao Yang and so on. So they told me like, well, if you have, uh, you know, uh, your, your, in, your pi tilde to be absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, so it has smooth density, a continuous density function in this case, then if you, you know, are willing to search among the ReLU network of length L, uh, depth M, right, in this case that such that the function is bounded, you know, then for any class of holder functions, A, you can approximate this with neural network with this rate, okay? So the rate involves parameter WL, N is the size of the data. Here's the killer. It's like this is the exponential uh, 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 curse of dimension here, right? The larger the parameters, the dimension is high. That's the killer here. So of course, you know, you, you, you approximate any kind of function with regularity. This you can extend this to, continue, uh, to smooth, smoother functions. You always have that, okay? Uh, provided W is the width, uh, length, length is the depth, like the number of compositions. So, so they have this characterization very carefully. So long, it, 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 this is, you know, uh, assuming like you choose your data to be bigger than pseudo dimension of this uh, uh, hypothesis clip space. So pseudo dimension is just basically a complexity measure, you know, that is uh, generalizing something called uh, VC dimension in the machine learning community for regression problem, okay? So now, okay, if you want to get away from the curse of dimension, you're really actually not getting away, but you have to assume more on your function. So this is actually yesterday was discussed a little bit by Lucas, right? Here's a version that we take from same source, I guess, win on E and so on, right? So if your function can be written in that way, like in integral way, like that, then, and here's, what they call a baron norm, which is basically these functions. Uh, you take expectation of this and take the infimum over, over all of the measure uh, such that this is true. Okay, so here's the definition of this. Then the result is just that now suddenly you don't have a curse of dimension. But basically the point I wanna make is like, in this case is like, you're basically estimating, I think a, an easier function. Although I personally, at this point, I still don't have a clear geometric or uh, uh, algebraic intuition to understand what is Baron space. How does Baron space sitting, you know, uh, what is the relationship with, between that and Sobolev space that, uh, Sobolev space that I'm more familiar with, I'm still not clear to me, yes. Sure. Uh, the solutions of what the 
Oh, the SD, well, the SDE is a stochastic process, right? But we're talking about now the P, right? The P is a density function, so it's a solution of the PDE. Uh, the PDE is elliptic, so I'm avoiding the hyperbolic stuff that is talking about the whole morning, right? So, you know, basically it depends on the regularity of A and C, so on. You just use lux milgram axis weak solutions, right? If everything L2 on the right-hand side usually, right? Right. Good. Right. So in this case, right, so, so it's two choice here. You know, you pick your devil, right? If your function, you assume less, like holder, then you, you know, basically can, you know, basically you, you back to the curse of dimension. If you assume more, you don't have a curse of dimension. Now, this is again, I was just mentioning to you a bunch of uh, comments, but let me cut it quick. So the, the, now those are, those are basically allow me to bound this first term, right? What allow me to bound the second term, basically you, you, we have this uh, lemma here on the second term here. You, you can bound the solutions of the PDE here in terms of that. Here we also assume Baron space because we use a uh, ReLU cubic functions. And the core of the tricks here of the proof is basically you're just trying to uh, uh, basically bound this guy on the right hand side by the cost functions, the, the true cost functions. And then you use a bunch of tricks such as uh, Hoff being all kind of uh, statistical tricks like uh, also Radamacher complexity type analysis to bound it in terms of the empirical uh, loss function. And then you can characterize them in terms of the rate. Okay, so basically those are the bulk of this work. And we also use generalization error bound by Tao Lo and Hai Chao Yang here. So let me stop, it's one o'clock here. So basically, uh, the overall error bound is achieved by you know, combining these lemmas. Uh, here we estimate ReLU using you know, neural network and you know, the, shell, uh, the, sh the, 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 the PDE in this analysis is using just shallow ReLU cubic activation functions. Now, among all of this, I would say the tacit assumption is because of the incompatibility of the topology. Now, here's uh, what I described most, more or less today is the first paper, which is going to appear in Sinem. Now, personally, I am actually more of, uh, actually preceding to this work is more, more or less working on the error bounds uh, on, on, on the, single, uh, the perturbation theory. So in this paper, actually, we also characterize epsilon differently. Epsilon not coming from neural networks. For example, we co uh, consider where you learn the drift and the, uh, the drift coefficients using uh, random features. Then all of this approximation theory, estimation theory from uh, this group of Juan Pablo Ortega and so on, we actually look at them. We just put them in the context. We also put the noise and so on. So we have all of the error bound in terms of noise and so on. Also. I also include a certain class of uh, sort of generalized Fourier series approximation. So basically, it's a kernel, RKHS kernel method where the features are eigenfunctions of, you know, uh, uh, self-adjoined differential operators. Then you, we can also have different type of error bounds in that case. But more or less, you know, you cannot actually escape you know, in the error bounds, you'll see like, you know, a lot of things like you'll see curse of dimension, you'll see dependent on the uh, error noise on your observations, and you'll see the delta T numerical discretization, it will come up. So basically, there's no, no free lunch on all of this. Okay, so that's it. Okay,